Inspection General's report on secondhand smoke and co-local action. My name is Claire Valderrama, and I'm a program assistant for Community Health, and we are very pleased to welcome all of you to this program. Please note that today's call is being recorded and that all participant lines will be muted during the broadcast. Today's presentation will last 90 minutes and includes a specific Q&A period at the very end. However, you may queue up a question for us at any time throughout the webcast, though all questions will be answered during the Q&A period at the very end. To enter a question through the web conference system, simply type your question in the chat box area on the lower left side of your screen and click on Send. To ask a live question over the phone during Q&A, please select star 1 on your touchtone phone. Your participation is key to the success of this webcast, so please don't hesitate to ask questions. At this time, I'd like to draw your attention to the links box on the left side of your screen. The links box contains links to websites and documents that are related to our program today, including the program evaluation. At the end of the program, we'll give you instructions on how to submit your online evaluation, and it'll just take a few minutes, and your comments and suggestions are incredibly important to us. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, who will introduce our speakers today. Kim Rash is the Director of the Health Services Division at the Washington County Health Department in Maryland and is also a member of Nature's Chronic Disease Workgroup. Kim, please go ahead. Thank you, Claire. Let's start by introducing the speakers for today's session. Today's speakers are Stephen Babb, Deanna Ferguson, Beth Thompson, Steve Layton, and Diana Forrester. Steve Babb is a health education specialist with the Health Communications Branch of the CDC Office on Smoking and Health. In this role, he develops and disseminates publications, presentations, and other materials on tobacco topics, responds to internal, public, and press inquiries, and tracks news media coverage of tobacco issues. Steve also serves as strategic coordinator for OSH's secondhand smoke activities. Prior to his current position, Steve spent three years as a program consultant with the program services branch, where he provided technical assistance to state tobacco control programs. Deanna Ferguson is a tobacco prevention specialist with Northern Wyoming Medical Health Center, resides in Newcastle, Wyoming, and is the program manager of Weston County Tobacco Prevention. Deanna is also the lead facilitator of the Weston County Tobacco Free Coalition and was instrumental in the inception of Weston County's active youth coalition risk, resisting the influence of substances that kill and regularly assists the Weston County Prevention Task Force and Health Promotion Coalition. Beth Thompson has worked in tobacco prevention in California since 1997 as project director of the Tobacco Education Program and of other grant-funded projects at Shasta County Public Health in Redding, California. At her instigation in December of 2000, Cal OSHA conducted stings of two bars with histories of worksite smoking violations, which resulted in the largest fines ever imposed in California for smoking violations. Prior health-related experience includes four years at the Texas Department of Health in Austin and three years at Multnomah County Public Health in Portland, Oregon. Steve Layton began his tobacco control career as a tobacco compliance educator slash officer in 2002 with the Shasta County Department of Public Health. In addition, in 2004, he joined the RESPECT team as a consultant promoting smoke-free multifamily housing. His major focus has been encouraging and supporting apartment owners and managers in adopting voluntary smoke-free policies in their complexes and working with local government to include smoke-free, low-income, multi-housing units in their ordinances. Prior to this, Steve worked in law enforcement for 15 years in Shasta County. Active in tobacco control since 1996, Diana Forrester is the chair of the Washington County Tobacco-Free Coalition and Washington County Initiative for Smoke-Free Environments since 2000. She is a tobacco control specialist for the Washington County Health Department, providing tobacco dependence treatment services and resources for clients, residents, and work sites. She's actively involved in educating the community on the effects of secondhand smoke and benefits of clean indoor air. She also worked with the West Bend policymakers to enact policies making it more difficult for youth to buy tobacco. Dan also serves as the chair of Treating Tobacco Dependence Team. That's the end of our introduction. So, Steve, I will turn it over to you to begin with your presentation. Well, thank you very much. Um, and, and I want to thank Nacho as well uh, for the opportunity to present today about a report that 
we're very proud of here. You can go to the next slide. So the 2006 um, Surgeon General's report on the health consequences of involuntary exposure to tobacco smoke um, it was, this, was only the second Surgeon General's report to focus on secondhand smoke and the first to do so in 20 years. Um, that The previous report to look at this topic had been the 1986 report. And you can go to the next slide. And the report was released um, on June 27th of 2006 by then Surgeon General Richard Carmona. And you can go to the next slide. And uh, in releasing the report, um, Dr. Carmona delivered a very strong message. Um, he, he began his speech, as you see here, by saying um, the, the debate about the health effects of secondhand smoke is over. Uh, the science is clear. And that message, both that, you know, those, that specific quote and the broader message that this report kind of put an end to any remaining uh, doubts about the fact that secondhand smoke is a serious health hazard was widely picked up by the media um, and had a broad impact. You can go to the next slide. Um, overall, this was the 29th um, Surgeon General's report on tobacco. Um, these reports go back to the, the uh, initial 64 report and have looked at a um, variety of topics around tobacco use and tobacco issues. Um, like the other reports in this series, this one systematically reviewed the scientific evidence. Um, and, and in this case, it basically looked back over the, the last 20 years. So all of the evidence on secondhand smoke and its health effects that it accumulated since the 86 report um, came out. And the report then assessed the evidence using established criteria of causality that are standard. They're, they're used, um, the same criteria are used across reports and topics. And you can go to the next slide. The report uh, is not something, as you, as you probably would imagine, that um, is done overnight. It, it takes quite a bit of time and effort. Um, this report took um, about four years, actually over four years, um, from, ten, from, from the beginning of the planning to the actual publication. And I want to acknowledge the really important role, um, indispensable role, played by Dr. Jonathan Samet of Johns Hopkins University, who acted as the senior scientific editor for this report and coordinated um, all the contributions. As you can see, quite a number of people were involved. Um, I, I'm not going to go through all of those, but you know, in a variety of roles, from writing the individual chapters, reviewing the chapters, and then um, review, uh, a number of people also reviewed the entire report. And those um, senior scientific reviewers represented CDC and a number of other um, federal government health agencies. So uh, the report was rigorously re reviewed. And uh, to make the cut, a conclusion really had to stand up to scrutiny and be based on very, very solid science. And you can go to the next slide. Um, the report provides an extensive review of the health effects of secondhand smoke, both in children and in non-smoking adults. And I'm going to talk. I'm going to begin by just talking very briefly about the major conclusions. The report had six major conclusions. Uh, the first one, um, and you'll you'll see them up here, is that secondhand smoke causes premature death and disease in both children and adults who don't smoke. Um, in terms of specific effects, health effects in children, an, an important new conclusion of this report was that secondhand smoke exposure um, after birth causes sudden infant death syndrome in children. Um, we'd previously known that um, active smoking by, by mothers during pregnancy um, could subsequently cause their children to die of SIDS. But th this report reached the new finding that, in addition, children who were exposed to secondhand smoke after birth were at inc increased risk of dying of SIDS. Um, secondhand smoke also causes acute respiratory infections, so bronchitis and pneumonia. And it causes middle ear disease, chronic, chronic uh, ear infections. Um, in children who already have asthma, it leads to um, worse cases of asthma, more frequent and more severe asthma attacks. Um, it causes respiratory symptoms, and it causes slowed lung growth. And then in adults, um, an important, not brand new, but, but um, I think 
this was uh, the highest visibility it's received from us yet. And an important conclusion is that secondhand smoke causes heart disease in non-smoking adults, and it also causes lung, lung cancer in non-smoking adults. You can go to the next slide. And uh, probably one of the most important major conclusions of the report is that there is no risk-free level of secondhand smoke. There is a threshold below which you can say, um, well, this is safe, you know, that uh, this, this level of exposure would not cause harm. Go to the next slide, please. In addition to addressing um, the health effects of secondhand smoke, the report also looked at how many people and, and, and who, what, you know, what groups, what types of people are exposed to secondhand smoke. And then finally, it looked at approaches to protecting people from secondhand smoke. Um, the report concluded that millions of Americans are still exposed to secondhand smoke at home and at work, and I'll go into this in a little bit more detail later. And in terms of um, approaches to protecting people, it concluded that only smoke-free places, only 100% smoke-free um, indoor spaces fully protect non-smokers from secondhand smoke exposure. Other approaches, um, such as separate smoking and non-smoking areas, um, air cleaning or ventilation, um, are not effective in eliminating exposure or completely protecting non-smokers. Next slide, please. Um, so the, the report looks at trends in secondhand smoke exposure. Um, overall, there's some really good news to report, which is that over the last 20 years or so, um, levels of secondhand smoke exposure among non-smokers have gone down really pretty dramatically. Um, if you look at, at levels of cotinine, which is a biological marker for nicotine and for secondhand smoke exposure, they've gone down by about 70% over the last 20 years. And the proportion of non-smokers who have detectable cotinine levels has been cut in half from about 88% uh, back in the late 80s. So, you know, really pretty much all non-smokers were showing evidence of secondhand smoke exposure then to about 43% uh, more recently. However, um, Having said that, more than 126 million non-smoking Americans, and that includes both children and, and adults, um, are still exposed to secondhand smoke. Um, and we know that um, certain groups are at especially high risk. They're, they're disproportionately exposed to secondhand smoke. Um, those groups include children. Children and teens tend to be more exposed um, than adults. African Americans tend to be more heavily exposed. And among workers, blue-collar workers, service workers, and hospitality workers are more likely to be exposed to secondhand smoke on the job. Um, the report concludes that the home and the workplace are the main settings where most non-smokers are exposed to secondhand smoke, which isn't surprising because that's where people, of course, spend much of their time. Um, some exposure does also occur in public places, such as restaurants, bars, and casinos, and so on. And also some exposure does occur in vehicles. And you can go to the next slide. Um, one important uh, area that the report looks at is the cardiovascular effects of secondhand smoke. How does secondhand smoke affect the cardiovascular system? And um, chapter two in the report, which looks at the toxicology of secondhand smoke, contains a, de a detailed discussion of this area. Um, some of the more important conclusions the report finds that secondhand smoke interferes with the functioning of the cardiovascular system in ways that can increase the risk of a heart attack. Um, and some of the specific mechanisms involved there are um, causing blood platelets to become stickier, um, damaging the lining of blood vessels. And people who already have heart disease are at special risk, so um, people who already have heart disease or risk factors for heart disease um, should take special precautions to avoid secondhand smoke exposure, to avoid um, potentially having more serious consequences triggered. And one important point to make in, you know, in this regard is there are millions of Americans who have heart disease or risk factors of heart disease without knowing it. Um, so I think that that's an important point to make. Um, the report concludes that secondhand smoke exposure at home or at work increases the risk of heart disease by about 25 to 30 percent in non-smokers. Um, as I mentioned, again, for more information on this, 
um, take a look at Chapter 2, which spells out in detail all of the various mechanisms um, by which secondhand smoke can impact the cardiovascular system. Next slide, please. Uh, another, uh, really the, the other major um, health effect for which there was sufficient evidence of causality in adults is lung cancer. Um, the report concluded that secondhand smoke increases the risk of lung cancer in non-smokers by about 20 to 30 percent. And that, again, as with heart disease, um, that applies both to exposure in, in the home or at work. Um, it's probably not surprising because secondhand smoke, um, another conclusion of the report is that secondhand smoke contains more than 50 um, substances that are known to cause cancer. And um, again, uh, the report, you know, it kind of adds to the evidence. A number of organizations, uh, major scientific organizations, are already on record as saying that secondhand smoke is a carcinogen, um, and that includes the National Toxicology Program, the International Agency for Research on Cancer and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency have all already uh, gone on the record as saying that secondhand smoke is a known human carcinogen. And uh, NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, has gone on the record as saying that secondhand smoke is an occupational carcinogen. So again, the report adds to that evidence. Um, in terms of um, death estimates, um, the California EPA report uh, which came out in, in 2005, estimates that about 23,000 to 70,000 uh, Americans, so these are non-smokers, um, die from secondhand smoke-related um, heart disease each year. So again, that's about 23,000 to 70,000 from heart disease. Another um, 30, at least 3,400, all the way up to potentially 9,000, uh, non-smokers die each year from secondhand smoke-related lung cancer. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, an important conclusion of the report is there is no risk-free level of exposure. And, um, you know, basically, uh, what does this mean? Well, it means, for one thing, even brief exposures potentially can um, damage cells in ways that can get the cancer process um, started. Um, as I just mentioned, there, there are some specific uh, mechanisms and effects by which even brief exposure to secondhand smoke can, can do immediate damage to the cardiovascular system, especially among folks who are already at risk or who already have heart disease. And then um, thirdly, in, in the area of the respiratory system, um, there, there are a number of mechanisms by which secondhand smoke um, can, can cause a very quick short-term irritation to the respiratory system as well. So there are a number of ways in which secondhand smoke can have very quick effects. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of children, I, I've already reviewed these. I won't spend a lot of time on them. Um, I think one important point to make about children is um, e even more so than adults, um, they don't have a lot of choice about being exposed to secondhand smoke. and You'll notice the title of the report um, refers to secondhand smoke as involuntary exposure. And one of the reasons for that was to reflect the fact that really most people um, don't choose to be exposed to secondhand smoke. They're in situations where they're being exposed, um, in many cases, against their will. But this is, of course, especially true of children, especially very young children who have very little control um, over their circumstances or exposure. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so in terms of uh, kind of policy implications or um, take-home messages, you know, we, so we know that secondhand smoke is bad for you. What can you do to protect yourself, either at work, at home, in public places, and so on? Well, again, the report concludes only smoke-free policies fully protect non-smokers. Other approaches, in particular ventilation, cannot eliminate exposure, and because there's no risk-free level, basically, if you can't eliminate exposure, you also cannot eliminate risk. Um, so there's really no such thing as a no-smoking section because, as we know, the smoke tends to drift from the smoking section to the, no to the non-smoking section. You can go to the next slide. Um, in terms of who's exposed, um, again, children are at a special risk of um, being exposed to secondhand smoke. Um, in the U.S. overall, children have co higher cotinine levels, which again is a marker for secondhand smoke, than adults do. 
Um, for most children, the main place where they're exposed is the home. And um, you, we know that evidence, uh, the evidence shows that children who live in homes with smokers um, have higher levels of exposure. And this is significant because about one in four um, American children aged three through 19 years live in a household with at least one smoker. And that's, that's a much higher percentage than the percentage of non-smoking adults who live with a smoker. Um, we also know that children can also be exposed to secondhand smoke in vehicles. Um, another major setting of exposure is the workplace, um, especially, of course, for adults. It can be a major source of exposure. Um, also an area where often uh, workers don't have a whole lot of choice about being exposed. And um, just as exposure in the home has been linked to increased lung cancer and heart disease risk, that's equally true for exposure in the workplace. Um, in terms of disparities, we know that blue-collar blue and service workers are less likely to be protected by smoke-free workplace policies. And um, restaurant and bar workers, and, and I would add casino and gaming workers, are even, even less likely to be protected on the job and more likely to be exposed to high levels of secondhand smoke. Um, another important conclusion of the report in this regard, it, it concludes that um, smoke-free policies do not ha have a negative um, economic impact on restaurants and bars and other hospitality businesses. And it bases that on carefully looking at a number of peer-reviewed studies that have examined objective economic indicators such as sales tax revenues, employment levels, and so on. And you can go to the next slide. So um, bottom line, you know, the report uh, reinforces that secondhand smoke exposure is a common public health hazard that is entirely preventable. Um, it's it's a uh, exposure that poses serious health risks to non-smokers. It's widespread, even though it's been going down. Um, you know, as I said, over 126 million Americans, close to 50% of non-smokers, are still exposed. And we know uh, that certain groups, such as hospitality workers, are at especially high risk of exposure, and that's also true of children. And um, the, the last thing is, unlike many other health hazards, secondhand smoke exposure is completely preventable. We know what works to prevent it, which is basically smoke-free environments, and it's, it's fairly easy to do that. So with that, I'm going to wrap up, and then um, at the end of the, the um, call, I would be glad to take questions. Thank you very much, Steve, for that overview of the report. Now we'll be moving on to three local health departments that have used the report for program planning and policy development. First, we will hear from Deanna Ferguson with Weston County. Deanna, go ahead. Thank you, Kim. I wanted to give everyone a visual of where Weston County, Wyoming is located. My office is in the far east side of the state in Newcastle, which is only 10 miles from the South Dakota border. And it's a very small rural community of about 6,600 people is all. It's coal mining, railroad, and oil refining are the main sources of employment. Um, we're located in a very scenic area, that's why I wanted to include that picture. Um, we're near the Black Hills of South Dakota, for any of you that are kind of aware of the region. And although the attitudes of many people in surrounding South Dakota and Wyoming counties have become very open to smoke-free policies, Weston County residents and business people remain a pretty tough sell. Um, we are, however, making strides, and I get positive feedback every day from those who appreciate and support our efforts. Next slide. Weston County Tobacco Prevention is a program funded primarily through CDC grant funds and some tobacco settlement trust funds, and they're allocated through the Wyoming Department of Health Substance Abuse Division. And it's now in its fourth year of existence with Northern Wyoming Mental Health as its fiscal agent and main supporting agency. Other coalitions, organizations, schools, and the media are also very active partners. Uh, the Wyoming Substance Abuse Division, with guidelines from CDC best practices, define our goals and objectives, and they have required activities that must be met within our fiscal grant year. And reducing exposure to secondhand smoke is definitely a very primary goal. Next. Incorporating the information on secondhand smoke from the Surgeon General's most recent report has been a key component in making a difference in furthering smoke-free policies, gaining public support for programs, and in creating other resources to help make a difference in our county. Um, I've noted the actual product numbers for the glossy secondhand smoke, what it means to you booklet, and several posters that you can get free through the CDC. 
And I believe there's one other poster that's not shown in there, but they're great tools. We utilize them a lot, and I will kind of show you more on, on how we do utilize them within Weston County. And I'm going to be going through the slides um, of the PowerPoint pretty quickly, but as you know, you'll be able to view them all later after the webcast um, where you can get a little more of the details off of those pages. Um, next slide. We all know how important media is in sharing public health messages, in gaining support for a cause, and expanding beneficial collaborations and accomplishing goals. While these avenues are not new to any of you, I hope it may spark a renewed interest in taking advantage of some of the free promotional opportunities that are available. And perhaps one or two of the examples that I give will give you an idea of something slightly different to try in your own community. Um, as mentioned, the Wyoming Department of Health has put high emphasis on gaining more smoke-free environments in our state, and we diligently educate on the many benefits of smoke-free workplaces, homes, and vehicles, and encourage voluntarily, um, voluntary adoption of smoke-free and tobacco-free policies. Next slide, please. With all of the national media and actually even world media on secondhand smoke right now, it's a prime time to tag onto these articles with ones either you write or supporters or coalition members write addressing the situation at the local level. Letters to the editor are very powerful and unfortunately sometimes the most difficult to get people to write. And I found most people in our community are not only reluctant to address this highly controversial topic but are also pressed for time. So to address the time issue, Creating a basic layout with main points to get them started is an idea. Go over the letter with them, offer to retype it, get them to sign it. Anything that you can do to, to help them is a, a big plus. And our local radio station is very willing to feature our program in free live interviews. They offer half-price ad rates. And I have a picture here on the screen showing um, where we're involving youth, and that's always a plus. It seems to get the public's attention. And most of the media outlets are very willing to provide free coverage of youth events. During an event, I also take action photos, not staged photos, um, to turn into the newspapers, because they, those are going to be the ones that they are going to tend to publish. And don't ever assume that they will come and cover an event, you know, because I'm sure you've all tried to do that at times and find that they don't show or they're busy with things. So I always take my camera along and take pictures, um, even do some basic write-ups, and turn it into them, and more times than not, they do get published. And I also have a tobacco talk column that both newspapers run um, minimum once monthly in both of the papers. They're really good about um, getting things in, so that's another avenue that a lot, of, um, a lot of local newspapers are really open to providing. Next slide, please. We have found that messages shared by healthcare providers seem to be the most powerful, as they are known as the experts in the field of health, obviously, and see the devastating effects of tobacco use and secondhand smoke on a daily basis. With obesity and other major health concerns on the rise, we continually address the hazards of tobacco use and secondhand smoke with our doctors and nurses. Tapping into a medical person who has a personal interest in this area and encouraging them to be part of your coalition to write articles for the paper, and most importantly, to address these issue with, issues with all of their clients is key. A local head nurse from our Newcastle hospital cut a radio ad which claimed she sees the devastating effects of secondhand smoke each day as a nurse, and as a mother and grandmother, she's very concerned about the hazards of secondhand smoke. Um, we do have several doctors who have been very willing to address secondhand smoke issues in the media. And just this month, an article was written by an orthopedic surgeon that was placed in our local news, uh, Newcastle paper, which addressed the hazards of secondhand smoke and quoted statistics directly from the Surgeon General's report. Next slide, please. Key secondhand smoke phrases and stats from the Surgeon General's report and the CDC are highlighted in a smoke-free dining pamphlet that we created for promoting our county smoke-free restaurants. Dining establishments that are not smoke-free receive frequent visits, mailings promoting the economic and health benefits of choosing a 100% smoke-free dining policy. And we encourage coalition members and supporters to participate in our dining sticker campaign whenever eating out, and that's down at the far left. We feel it's kind of a nice way to thank them for being smoke-free and then also asking them to go 
smoke-free that we'll visit more often, and we stick those right on our uh, bills as we go up and pay. And this slide features a couple examples of some local paid advertisements that were part of the Wyoming Live Work Play Smoke-Free campaign. And just depending upon your own funding, you may be able to work with a co-op purchase with a smoke-free restaurant or possibly get a, a major sponsor to help with running similar ads that promote smoke-free environments. Next slide. The Wyoming Department of Health has incorporated a Tobacco-Free Schools of Excellence component into each of our Tobacco-Free Wyoming Communities grant programs, placing high importance on achieving 100% tobacco-free policies within all school districts. And locally, our youth coalitions incorporate secondhand smoke hazards along with tobacco-free lifestyles in all of their activities. One slide photo shows um, their parade float. And it's the Smoke-Free Homes Produce Smoke-Free Kids. And they came up with this total um, slogan and campaign on their own, which I thought was really neat. And after the Surgeon General's report came out, the kids created posters highlighting the six major conclusions of the report and displayed them within the school halls. And secondhand smoke education and providing tools and resources for teachers has also been a main focus. When the announcer reads the tobacco-free policy at sports events, we have a youth coalition member usually runs out in, in what they call a ciggy suit with um, the tongue hanging out of it, so it's not a, it's not a good cigarette <laughs> look. And they throw out several water bottles with the RISC logo and motto to the fans, and inside the water bottles is info on our Wyoming Quit Tobacco program and also lists the six major conclusions of the Surgeon General's report on secondhand smoke. Next slide, please. We take advantage of school mailings to parents parent-teacher conferences, and other free public venues where resources and the Surgeon General's message can be shared. The gold section above is taken directly from the Surgeon General's report. And what I did, I copied it onto heavy paper and hand this out to parents, um, take a supply to the public libraries and children's center. And the bottom right shows one of several glossy posters that is available free through the CDC. We've posted these in waiting rooms, provided them to dental offices to place on walls and their ceilings and their exam rooms, and also taken to businesses to post within their break rooms. At the top left, the high school bulletin included a caption on secondhand smoke and its hazards. I don't know if you can read it, but it says, breathing secondhand smoke increases your risk of heart disease and lung cancer by up to 30%. A 2006 Surgeon General's report found that even brief secondhand smoke exposure can do damage. Encourage your child to visit only smoke-free restaurants, stores, and friends' houses. So every couple months, they also insert a separate information sheet that I create to educate parents on communication skills with their children regarding substance abuse in general, secondhand smoke hazards, or the state's quit opportunities. Next slide. These are examples of just a few displays. Um, we usually set up several different kinds and types, but we'll um, appear at all kinds of different activities. Uh, we'll set up booths at um, community health fairs, teen wellness fair. We recently had a meth conference here in Newcastle. We annually do a back to school bash. Um, we participate in post prom events. And then we also set up within schools and within our hospital during general awareness campaigns. Next slide. Our program distributes a quarterly newsletter, and the one shown features an article on the Surgeon General's report right on the front page. And we always try to tap into other organizations' newsletters and bulletins also. For instance, top right, Northern Wyoming Mental Health printed an article on the Surgeon General's report listing the six major conclusions, and then they distributed that to all of their employees within all of their facilities within the state of Wyoming. Our local Chamber of Commerce also plugged the report into their newsletter, and various businesses placed the flyer shown at the bottom as a paycheck stuffer promoting the Wyoming Quit Tobacco Program and the phrase, don't underestimate the hazards of secondhand smoke to others or the benefits to you in quitting. Next slide. Our program regularly distributes a smoke-free homes kit, with many of the items being provided by the state of Wyoming, such as a pan scraper, a hot pad, a wall plaque, jar opener, and window cling. Other resources were provided by the EPA, CDC, and American Cancer Society. In all kits distributed since last June, we have also included a copy of the Surgeon General's report on secondhand smoke. Next slide. 
On a daily basis, quit smoking packets are distributed through various healthcare facilities and our local pharmacy. And each packet contains a copy of the Surgeon General's report from 2006 as well as the report from 04, various pamphlets providing tips on quitting, a card promoting the Wyoming Quit Tobacco Program, a card with the four Ds, a snack size Ziploc bag with toothpicks, straws, rubber bands, cinnamon candy, um, things that will help them not only kick their addiction but the habit of holding the cigarette and having something in their mouth. And then many national agencies offer free resources also that you can tap into to include in these packets. Next slide. I wanted to share um, a few graphics. I love the photo on the right, which shows a designated smoking area. So when the smokers look up, it appears as if they're down in the grave watching their own gravesite ceremony. And I just think that's a really clever idea and a, a powerful message. I've used the secondhand smoke cartoons in some of my presentations and newsletters. And I hope that they're big enough for, for you to see. Next slide. Um, there are many related Wyoming sites that have lots of information on secondhand smoke and tobacco-free lifestyles. And so I've just listed some here. Again, they'll be available for you to review after the webcast. Next slide. And of course, there are numerous national sites that you can tap into for information and resources. There, the list is basically endless. Um, you can print small, but um, you'll be able to access this information later, and you can copy and paste it larger if you'd like. Um, final slide, please. To end my presentation, I'd just like to say that I really appreciate the opportunity to share information with you on the Weston County Tobacco Prevention Program and how we have utilized the Surgeon General's report within our small rural community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deanna. Next are Beth Thompson and Steve Layton from Shasta County. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome from Northern California. Um, uh, this is Beth, and I'm going to start. Uh, let me begin by giving you some information to help you locate Shasta County in Northern California. We're about three and a half hours north of San Francisco, but still two hours south of the Oregon border. Uh, Shasta County has a population of about 177,000, and Redding is the one major city with about 90,000 people. Um, we're rural. We're, we're not quite as rural as Deanna, um, but uh, Redding is on the I Interstate 5 corridor that runs the whole length of the state. And Shasta County is generally considered to be politically conservative. And so Steve and I today are going to talk about some policy work we've been doing in the county. Um, I'm going to start by talking about the promotion of voluntary smoke-free entryways with the business sector. And this project was based on some statewide legislation that was passed um, making government buildings entryways smoke-free. And then Steve will follow up with uh, a discussion about promotion of voluntary smoke-free housing. And his project actually just builds on public smoke-free sentiment, um, there is no, at this point, legislative ba uh, basis for the housing yet. Next slide. This is a um, kind of summary of the milestones of tobacco control in California, and I just want to point out that our uh, the California Smoke-Free Workplace Law went into effect in 1995, and this was really a turning point in our state um, and um, made everyone aware that um, there was no safe level of secondhand smoke and, and changed the perspective of people. Next slide. In Shasta County, um, we actually in 1993 passed a Smoke Creek work site ordinance. And, um, you know, you all are out there throughout the county, if, the country. If you know of any other earlier countywide Smoke Creek uh, legislation, let me know, but I think we might have been the first countywide. There were some municipalities and cities that had passed things, but not countywide. And then in 1999, uh, we established the position of a tobacco compliance officer, um, which is what Steve does part-time for us. And this has been an extraordinarily successful um, project. And so I've got my telephone number there, and if anyone wants to call me and I can talk about that at a later date, I'd be happy to do that. Next slide. The history of entryway movement in 
um, Shasta County um, was basically an amplification of the California smoke-free workplace law. And what we found was as the public became comfortable with smoke-free workplaces, they really liked it, and they came to resent smoke-filled entryways. And so across the state, complaints to authorities increased. Next slide, please. Um, the, the content of the California smoke-free entryway law basically says that smoking is prohibited in an outdoor area within 20 feet of a main exit, entrance, or operable window of the building, occupied and owned or leased by the state, a county, a city, or a California community college district. The effective day was January 2004, and there was no enforcement specified and no penalty. And generally, this is considered to be um, a liability. But in this case, because there is quite a bit of public support for smoke-free environments, we have found that the public will self-enforce laws um, if there's clear signage. Next slide. slide. And after the county, uh, the statewide um, uh, legislation was passed, there was extensive media coverage. But what happened was the public didn't really um, understand that the law covered only government buildings. And so in our county, complaints of smoking in all of the county entryways increased. And we actually had a number of calls where people called and accused us of not enforcing the law. Next slide. So what our strategy was, was we, we decided to respond to all the complaints. So we would go to the owners and managers of the businesses that where a complaint had been filed, and we asked them if they were interested in um, ha uh, passing or developing a voluntary policy. And we found most of them were very interested. They didn't know they had the right to do it, and they thought it was discrimination. Next slide. Uh, the, their motivation for wanting um, smoke-free entryways was basically they were tired of people congregating near the doors and impeding the flow of customers. There was less butt litter at the entryways, and they also didn't have to deal with the complaints from customers, um, especially, as Steve has said, those with uh, asthma or those entering with children. Next slide. Our enforcement, we actually have found, is... Um, fairly easy. Um, signage is critical. Um, putting a sign up will empower people to speak up. And um, business management rarely has to intervene in enforcement when there is a, a visible sign. Next slide. I think the um, our success is built on a community norm for tobacco-free uh, living and um, I think we all know that uh, to move toward that um, norm, it requires education about the tobacco use, the risk of tobacco use and secondhand smoke. I encourage people not to forget smokeless tobacco because that's the industry, tobacco industry's new front. And then we also have done over the years a lot of community-wide education with those usual people that we all work with. Uh, next slide. We also have used a lot of media coverage, as um, Deanna had, has talked about. We've done sponsorship of smoke-free events to influence community norm. And as I said, we promote a lot of policy work. Um, voluntary policies, where the more voluntary policies we get, the better. And um, also legislated um, policies, obviously. And um, if you get to that point, I encourage you not to forget state smoke-free stadium seating. Our ordinance included that. We're one of the very few in all of California that included that, and it's very popular here. And then also you affect community norm by signage and hotline cards. Um, next slide. Uh, this is one of our latest developments, which has been um, very popular. This is a, a business card, and we've produced them in the thousands. We have health public health people distributing them all over, and it basically reports or, or advertises a line to call where people can report a tobacco violation or receive more information on the laws. And on the back side of the card, we list the laws that are applicable, applicable in our county. And um, Steve's phone got really busy after we started getting this um, card out there. Next slide. The other sign that we use a lot is 
just the standard um, entryway sign. Um, 20 feet is great. If you can get a little farther, it's even better. Um, 30 feet would probably keep people over about 20 feet, but this has worked really, really well here. Uh, next slide. We have found over the years that when we're um, promoting tobacco control issues, there's a kind of a sequence that has worked well. Um, working with the government sector first has the advantage that it's a quite a wide range of people. There's usually internal enforcement capabilities, and government agencies generally validate the health focus um, that we're trying to promote. The next industry is the um, um, food industry, and tobacco and food preparation have one of the longest histories of being tobacco-free. People really don't like to eat in smoke-filled environments. And then the third sector is moving into the private businesses. Um, businesses are obviously vulnerable to public sentiment, and they're worried about their bottom line and anything that we um, can propose that can help them um, be more profitable, they're interested in. And Steve will talk more about this in a minute. So next slide. Um, the reminders are that um, it's, uh, using the Surgeon General's support is your foundation. Um, we found that we, we have learned to be cognizant about when to promote health <coughs> issues and when to promote cost savings. And generally, in the business community, they're faster to respond to economic fast factors than health issues. So we have learned to couch our health messages as cost savings. So we talk about things like avoiding litigation and use the information that Steve has um, discussed on why they might be vulnerable um, if they're allowing people to be exposed. And we talk about maintenance savings and um, less litter and things like that. Next slide. And with that, I will turn it over to Steve. Hi, I'm Steve Layton. I work uh, in the American Lung Association Respect Project, and I also do Shasta County Public Health uh, Enforcement. And uh, I do uh, voluntary smoke-free housing. And uh, to con convince some of these people, I uh, tell them that it's good for business and good for the community. Next slide. Why smoke-free housing? There's a market demand. It reduces the uh, maintenance costs. And uh, what owners want to know, it improves their bottom line. Why voluntary policies? Next slide. Um, they're much easier to get into place uh, rather than going through the um, legal system. You just go in and talk to the owners and managers and get their input on it. Have them help you put on what kind of policy do they want to um, put into their own complex. And uh, it demonstrates that smoke-free multi-unit housing can work, and it does work in our area. And when you're talking, uh, next slide, when you're talking with the owners and the managers, um, some of their concerns will be, uh, what's this going to do for me? Am I going to be sued for this? And uh, they want some good tenant screening. And who's going to enforce these smoke-free policies? And to, uh, next slide. When you answer some of their concerns, one of the biggest things that I really want, if nothing else gets um, out of this, I want everyone to realize that there's no constitutional right to smoke. And uh, some of their concerns will be the Surgeon General's report provides ample scientific evidence of health risk associated with secondhand smoke exposure. And uh, there's a demand for this. You'll be able to fill your smoke-free units. And uh, next slide. And when you're talking to them, you know, we've, we've done some studies, and the Goodwin-Simon uh, Strategic Research has done studies on this, and 82% of tenants prefer to live in a smoke-free building or section of the building. And this one kind of relates to a lot of them is uh, it's a 69% favor requiring all buildings to offer non-smoking rooms. And you can uh, kind of go into the effect of uh, this is how a motel does it. So most people can relate that they want a non-smoking room. And uh, people living in apartments, uh, 46 have experienced smoke, smoke drifting into their apartments. Next slide. Maintenance expenses. They'll be concerned, uh, the owners and managers, and they can always see that cigarette burns are to, in their carpets and it's going to cost them more to, um, to redo a, uh, an apartment complex or building unit that has a smoker in it. And uh, another thing that we just found out recently was uh, through the Money Magazine, um, Farmers Insurance Company is offering a 10% uh, reduction in fire insurance that they uh, can prove that they have a smoke-free building. And owners and managers really like that. They, they want to know 
what's it going to do for me? And when you're talking to them, and if they have employees, many of them do, you know, the maintenance workers and stuff, uh, it, it subjects their staff and themselves to secondhand smoke, and uh, we're finding that secondhand smoke, there's no, uh, no amount that's going to uh, be okay. One of the biggest concerns is uh, smoke-free housing. Is it legal? And is there a right to smoke? Do smoking restrictions invade a tenant's privacy? Is a no-smoking policy discrimination? What about disability laws? They'll all ask these questions. And back to uh, no constitutional right to smoke. No smoking policies are legal, equivalent of other rental restrictions. They fall under the same category as not allowing pets or loud music at night. Um, smokers are not protected class. Oh, next slide. I'm sorry. Smokers are not protected. I'm uh, up there, and there is no constitutional right to smoke. Smokers are not a protected class, such as race or gender. Smoking is behavior, not a condition of birth. Next slide. And I'm at, uh, do smoking restrictions invade a tenant's right to privacy? The courts have found that the right to privacy does not include smoking or even, even in one's apartment. The constitutional right to privacy only protects decisions about family and other things like that. It doesn't, it doesn't affect smoking at all. Uh, next slide. How do disability laws apply? Tenants with disabilities have special rights. If a tenant's disability is made worse by the exposure to secondhand smoke, such as asthma or severe respiratory problems, then that tenant, he can actually sue and go, uh, you know, get special concerns with prohibiting smoking in common areas or move that tenant to another unit. Next slide. When you're dealing with common areas on a, uh, an apartment complex, such as the lobby and hallways, laundry room, things like that, uh, many of those are covered with uh, state laws. But when you're dealing with outdoor common areas, it's um, some of the places to start around the pool area, the barbecue area, and a children's play area is one of the easiest places to get a volunteer policy in a uh, complex. And when you change that, uh, you know, a common area, you usually don't have to change any of the individual leases. When you're dealing with the individual units, um, it's good to prohibit smoking, you know, in that unit. But one of the main things is um, uh, dealing with the patio and the balconies and things where you'll get uh, secondhand smoke. That's one of the biggest complaints that I get is people smoking on a patio and then it goes into a uh, um, it goes into the next uh, building and next slide there on individual units. And when you're talking with a uh, a manager or an owner, um, you know, they're, they're going to say, well, I can't uh, uh, rent to a smoker. Well, that's not really the case. They just can't smoke on the property of that uh, complex. And a big thing to do is how to do this. You've got to give the tenants at least 30 days, go with 90 days, and give it to them in writing. Most people, uh, they, they want to know what, what is happening in the future. And to make the change smoothly, next slide. Um, decide how much protection do you want. Do you want to go 100%? And there's different, many different ways to do this. Um, you can go uh, just inside of the building. But one of the biggest things, another thing to really watch, is you have to have a smoking area somewhere. Um, it can even actually be in the, in the tenant's cars, if you want, in the parking lot. But there needs to be some type of smoking area. Otherwise, I find it really just doesn't work. And when you're dealing, uh, next slide. And when you're dealing with the uh, affordable housing, um, HUD, Section 8, things like that, um, federal law has said that uh, they can actually do this. They can have 100% smoke-free buildings as long as they grandfather in the people that are there. You can't evict somebody for smoking in that case. Um, and grandfather means you can um, change it during their lease renewal. And uh, smoke-free rentals, next slide. Smoke-free rentals are valuable properties. They're easier for the managers to, to manage. Units are less costly to turn over, and uh, they're the wave of the future. Next slide. Um, there's a good website here on the RESPECT website uh, that will give you much more information on that. Next slide. Or you can contact myself or Beth Thompson at uh, what's listed below, and thank you. Thank you very much, Beth and Steve. Lastly, we will hear from Diana Forrester. Go ahead, Diana. 
Thank you. Good afternoon. Our, my office is located in West Bend, Wisconsin, which is Washington County, and we are just north of Washington County, um, which is a half an hour away from the major metropolitan area, Milwaukee, which that, that being the largest city in the state. Washington County has an estimated population of just over 126,000 people. 97.5% of our population is white, with 1.6% of our population Hispanic or Latino. Our county is primarily middle class conservative Republicans, and our county consists of two cities, five villages, and 13 towns. Next slide, please. I decided to, to utilize some strategies using the Surgeon General's report and tried to go at it from a different angle. And one of the rationales that I have is I, we receive our funding from the Department of Health and Family Services and get direction from the Wisconsin Tobacco Prevention and Control Program. Each year we receive our funding and we write specific objectives. And a big component of the program has been to work on clean indoor air initiatives in our communities. There's also been a strong mandate and direction from the Wisconsin Tobacco Prevention and Control Program to continue to educate wherever possible and to reach out to local policymakers. When the release of the Surgeon General's report came out, I thought it was crucial that all policymakers receive this information. The format that I chose was to have this come out um, in the form of a letter from the health officer and myself on official health department letterhead. It's one way that one leader can share important information to another, and I believe that a lot of respect comes from that. Next slide, please. The goal or the purpose of the strategy that I used was to educate local leaders and business owners regarding the risks associated with exposure to secondhand smoke, and also to promote the Washington County Health Department and the Tobacco-Free Coalition as leaders in public health and tobacco prevention and control. In, in the year 2000, when I started at the health department, I began an education initiative in the city of West Bend, focusing on the risks associated with secondhand smoke and the benefits to clean indoor air. This initiative took on a new form when in 2002 we went public with our initiative for smoke-free restaurants in the city of West Bend. This was one of the times that our local health officers stuck her neck out to promote the mission of the health department and the Washington County Tobacco-Free Coalition and to get our names out there as leaders in public health and tobacco prevention and control. At that time, the mandate from our state tobacco prevention and control program was to work on restaurant initiatives. Unfortunately, our campaign did not produce a smoke-free restaurant community. However, we set the stage for change within our community. Many restaurants, bars that have since opened are now completely smoke-free, and some that allowed smoking have since changed their policy. Next slide, please. I had two major strategies that I utilized, outreach to the Wisconsin policymakers, our local mayors and village trustees, and outreach to the Washington County business owners. How I did that was I partnered with the state of Wisconsin sanitarians and licensed bar and restaurant establishments. In the year 2000, I first partnered with the state of Wisconsin sanitarians, and at that time I had created a document that gave facts about secondhand smoke. The sanitarians handed those out to licensed bar and restaurant establishments upon their inspection. So when the news came out about the Surgeon General's report, I wanted to see if we could partner again on a new project. Next slide, please. Through the outreach, again, I needed to engage the support of my local health officer. And as I said, when she stuck her neck out in the year 2002 for our campaign, she did take a lot of heat. And so I needed to, to ask her if, if she would support this initiative. And I, I feel that it's a crucial component of this project to get her support. And I think it made a, a huge difference. I think it, it, again, attains a lot of respect when you have one leader speaking to another leader. I developed and distributed an educational packet, uh, the cover letter from the health officer and myself, there were a total of 110 letters that were mailed out to uh, local policymakers, along with the six major conclusions of the Surgeon General's report and a brochure that I'll share with you later called To the Health of Your Business. 
Uh, the difference, you know, I think, again, that was so key about the Surgeon General's report is that here we had some information that was coming out from the Surgeon General of the United States that was factual and compelling. It came at a great time for us here in Wisconsin as we've really been struggling through the years to pass local initiatives. This gave us some ammunition to fight with. Next slide, please. As you'll see here, I'm not sure if you can see this real clearly, but if, if anybody ever needs a copy, you know, you can contact me. My contact information is at the end of my presentation. This is the letter that I sent out to the local policymakers. I highlighted the six major findings of the Surgeon General's report, and I also uh, handed them or gave them the, the brochure that I had shared with you to the health of your business. I re uh, next slide, please. One of the goals that I really had, or the key points of the cover letter, was that I think that policymakers have uh, a need to protect the constituents from serious health effects of secondhand smoke. Many of them have them in the missions and the visions of the of their communities. And I wanted to emphasize the establishment of smoke-free policies and regulations that the most effective way to protect everyone's right to breathe clean and dirt air is to pass a policy. At the time, uh, Wisconsin had 29 Wisconsin communities with smoke-free policies, and right now we have 30. Today, also, there was uh, good news in our state where uh, our governor just released information stating that he will be calling on all legislators to ban smoking in all public buildings, workplaces, restaurants, and taverns. So this was a huge breakthrough for us here in Wisconsin. Next slide, please. The next strategy that I used was to outreach to Washington, Washington County business owners. And I, again, engaged the support of the local health officers. And I partnered with the state of Wisconsin sanitarian. Our, at our health department, uh, we need to utilize the state sanitarians to do inspections out in our county. And I had an in-person meeting with them. I prov provided education and gained support for implementation from them. I gave them all of the information about the Surgeon General's report and the letter and the brochure that I wanted them to hand out. And they were very supportive and said that they would, they would move ahead with this. There's a total of 298 licensed restaurant and bar owners in Washington County. And just this year, through the Department of Health and Family Services, our health department just received limited agent status in 2007, which means our local health department will be inspecting establishments with limited food service, lodging, and campgrounds. So out of the 298 facilities, our local staff will have direct access through local inspections of 60 licensed restaurant bar owners, and they will be handing out this material to the owners. The information that they are receiving elevates the importance of the health status of smoke-free air, similar to other regulations such as hand washing and food temperature control, emphasizing the need to protect all workers and patrons from the damaging effects of secondhand smoke. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. This is the copy of the letter that was handed out to the local business owners. It's pretty much the same as the one that I sent out to the policymakers. The only difference is they received uh, just the six major conclusions of the Surgeon General's report along with uh, the, the business, the, um, the pamphlet, and it's handed to them directly as the inspectors go into the establishment, and they also give them just some additional information that they may have personally. Next slide, please. This is the brochure that I referred to. It's called To the Health of Your Business. It came out from the American Non-Smokers Rights Foundation. I received a copy of this from our Tobacco Control Resource Center of Wisconsin and thought it was fabulous. I wanted to get this out to business owners and to educate them on the real issue and bottom line facts that are affecting their employees and patrons. Next slide, please. On the back side of, of this brochure, I put on a label highlighting that, that the resource was being sent 
from the Washington County Tobacco-Free Coalition, along with my contact information. And in addition, whenever possible, I always try and promote our Wisconsin Tobacco Quit Line, so I place that information on there as well. Next slide, please. The outcomes and responses. When I sent the letter out to the local policymakers in fall, I had one phone call from a village trustee. He questioned the purpose of the outreach and communication, and we ended up having a long dialogue about the dangers of secondhand smoke and how he could possibly use this information in his community, and I was basically doing it as an outreach because my role, of course, was to educate. As far as the implementation of the business owners, that outreach just began in October. Uh, the feedback is pending. I'm planning to do follow-up meetings uh, with the sanitarians to discuss any feedback or concerns that are raised as they're distributing the materials. And then I'll also be working with our local health department staff to educate them on their role with the business owners what, that they inspect. In addition to that, as far as working with the policymakers, I am working in two communities in Washington County to further educate on a policy change. And I anticipate additional mailings such as, a, as a regional newsletters that we produce here in, um, in Washington, or in the southeastern region, it's called. And, in, and I'm hoping to hold in-person meetings as well. In addition to that, as other major findings related to smoke-free air come up, I'll use that opportunity to outreach to either targeted communities or to the entire community. Next slide, please. Here is my contact information. I, I thank you for the opportunity to share a couple of the strategies that we used here in Washington County. And if you need anything else, you can always contact me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana, and thank you to all of our speakers this afternoon. We'll now move into the question and answer phase of the program. And on your screen, you should see information as to how you can go about asking a question. We have been receiving some questions throughout the program. And I will start with the first question. Was This question is probably directed best to Steve Babb. Is there a way to quantify a little small amounts or brief exposure to secondhand smoke? Um. Yeah, it's a good question. There really isn't an easy way um, to do that. Um, uh, you know, I would say I would go back to the major conclusion of the report that there's no risk-free level. So, um, you know, the safe thing is to, when possible, avoid exposure altogether. Now, in the real world, that may not always be possible, and 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 I. You know, the other point I wanted to make is the dose of exposure does matter. And for many people who, who are still exposed to secondhand smoke, it's sort of a moot point because if, if you're exposed in the home or in the workplace, um, you're likely to be being exposed for hours at a time, day after day. So uh, it's not brief exposure at all. Um, but, you know, having said that, especially for people who already have respiratory diseases or heart disease, um, even brief exposures can have effects. And I'm sorry, I, I know you're probably looking for a more specific answer, but um, th th there isn't any easy answer to quantifying that. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is directed to Deanna Ferguson. How many health educators assist with implementation of your tobacco control program? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Actually, I'm also happy to say that pretty much all of our health educators do. There's two school districts here in Weston County, so we're not talking about a lot of schools, but in each elementary, middle school, and high school, we actually have three elementary schools within the district. All of the health educators do do it on their own, and then they also are very willing to have me come in and assist them with a particular event or during all of our awareness campaigns. I will definitely go into the high schools and do a PowerPoint with the kids or actually do a type of an activity. And then again, with our youth coalitions, a lot of the health educators are even starting to get involved with assisting in some of those activities. So if nothing else, I will provide some different resources, but I've been really fortunate that they're all doing a certain amount of it on their own, as they should be. 
I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Thank you. I think it okay. did. Um, the next question I'll direct back to Steve Babb. What is the percentage of lung cancer or cardiovascular disease if you are exposed both at home and at work? And that's another good question, and it's a difficult one to answer. Most studies don't break it down that way. They, they uh, measure exposure either by people saying they're, you know, they're married to someone who smokes, for example, to get a home-based exposure, or they work in a workplace where someone smokes in their work area. Um, having, so so they, they look at one or the other. Typically, they don't look at both. Um, having said that, you know, commonsensically, you would, you would expect the, um, the, the increase in risk to be additive. So if you're exposed both at home and at work, you would, you would expect the risk to be, you know, that much higher um, than if you're exposed only at one location but not the other. And it's a very good point because, uh, you know, it suggests that a lot of um, the traditional studies that, that have been done may underestimate the, the risk associated with exposure, and for example, a study done um, in England a couple of years ago and, and published in the British Medical Journal, which looked at cotinine levels um, to measure exposure, so, so an objective measure of exposure rather than someone saying they were exposed at home or work, found that for folks with the highest cotinine levels, the increase in, in a heart disease risk was actually closer to 60% rather than 25 to 30%. So, um, you know, for folks who are getting more exposure in more settings, their risks are likely to be even higher, um, but, but the report does not directly quantify that. Okay, thank you. Following up a little bit on that, we had a couple of questions about secondhand smoke exposure outdoors, parks or outdoor venues. Is this the same as the risk would be associated with an indoor venue? And that, again, it's a good question. The report did not directly address that. I'd, I'd refer you, um, the California EPA report that came out in 2005, the first section of that report, it's a big report, but the first section um, looks a lot at exposure, and it has a section specifically on outdoor exposure, and in particular there's some cl conclusions around it on page uh, 59 of Section 5, Roman, Roman numeral 5, and then page 59. Uh, you know, I will emphasize those are Cal EPA's conclusions, not ours. But, uh, you know, I think the, the thing to remember with outdoor exposure, um, indoor exposure is likely to be higher. So most states and communities typically will address indoor exposure first. Now, if you've addressed most indoor sources of exposure, some people um, – May their main remaining exposure may be outdoors because that's all that's left. In general, the absolute levels of exposure are likely to be lower just for obvious reasons, you're outdoors. But, but then again, common sense would tell you it may differ by setting. So if you're in a stadium or in assigned seating where you're sitting next to someone and you can't get up and move easily and the person next to you is smoking and you're exposed for a prolonged period of time, that might be higher than if you walk by someone on the sidewalk. But uh, we don't directly quantify that um, in, in the report. I think the other point I'd make is, there are, from my perspective, there are legitimate health reasons other than um, secondhand smoke and protecting people from secondhand smoke for certain types of outdoor smoking restrictions. And those include you know, setting a positive model for youth, um, sending a consistent message, for example, if you're a hospital, um, in some cases addressing litter concerns, addressing fire concerns, and so on. And I, I think what I'd say is depending on the setting um, where you're thinking about, um, you know, establishing a policy, you may want to think through what the most legitimate and justifiable reasons are and, and place the emphasis accordingly. And in some cases, maybe the main motivation isn't to protect people from secondhand smoke, but some of the other reasons I just mentioned. Okay, thank you very much. I've been getting a couple of questions involving different populations, especially minorities, communities of color, American Indian gaming populations, and I'll address this to any of the speakers if any of them have had any particular experience in working with any of these populations that have been seen to be at a higher or highest rates of exposure to secondhand smoke and what initiatives they have taken and how they can involve those populations. 
Um, this is Beth in uh, Shasta County, in California, and we actually in our county have two casinos, so I can speak about the Native American um, outreach. Um, one casino actually made a commitment. They were building a new uh, facility, and they made a commitment to make it smoke-free. It turned out that didn't happen, but they have um, very large ventilators at the top, and they try. Um, the other casino um, is very small. It's not as um, uh, um, lucrative a casino, and it's got very heavy smoke. Um, some of the things that we've found that they do respond to are would be using the Surgeon General's data because they are they get a, a fair number of workers' comp claims from casino workers who end up going out on disability because of the um, heavy exposure to smoke. So that seems to be something that they're now considering. Um, and even the very smoky casino in our uh, county is going to implement a section, a smoke-free section, which we never believed they would ever do. So that might be one strategy is just to talk about the health risks and how much, again, couch it in how much money they'll save. Okay, thank you very much. I actually got another question specifically for you, Beth, so I will ask at this time. Are most of your signs directly on the buildings, or are they 20 feet from the exterior of the building? Um, it, it kind of can depend. It's good to put them away from the entrance to warn people as they're coming up. Um, often that's not possible, so they can be right on the door. Um, all of our um, big box uh, department stores in have them right on the doors, and it says you can't smoke within 20 feet. We do tend to ask them to move the ashtrays 20 feet away, and so that does the people who are standing outside who might be smoking are 20 feet away from the door. Okay, thank you. I will address this one back to Steve Babb. How do you respond to allegations that the Surgeon General's report is based on a political agenda instead of on actual facts? Well, I guess all I can say is anybody who's gone through the review process, I mean, as I said, it took four years. It's rigorously reviewed um, by, uh, you, you know, a large number of scientists in different agencies. and. Um, the same established criteria of causality are applied to all of the, the findings, and frankly, that's you know that's part of why, um, for certain um, outcomes, health outcomes, like uh, for example, we concluded the evidence was suggestive, um, but not yet quite conclusive to to um, reach the conclusion that secondhand smoke causes breast cancer. Now, Cal EPA, which is a very um, highly regarded, um, you know, scientifically rigorous uh, organization, just because they have slightly different ways of weighting the evidence, um, reached a slightly different conclusion where they, where they felt the evidence was conclusive. But I think that's, you know, that's just an example. It indicates, you know, um, how carefully reviewed the evidence was and uh, really, you know, the, politics does not enter into the process. It's, it's a very rigorous and carefully controlled scientific process, which is why it took so long. Okay, thank you very much. And I will address this to all of our speakers or anyone who wants to jump in and answer. What promotional strategies do you find most effective to recommend smoke-free homes and smoke-free cars? Hi, this is Steve. <clears throat> I think um, as long as you go in there and uh, get the, uh, the in the homes, if you can find a bottom line, you know, if kids are involved, people will you generally listen, um, and also and owners of the home, if it's a rental, um, the turnover is incredible. The heating and air conditioning is a huge savings on a smoke-free home. Um, we're getting some studies in now that uh, uh, it shortens the life of a heating and air conditioning unit, which is very expensive for an owner or a landlord or anybody else in, inside the home. So I, I try to go with them, um, and generally they're not 100% concerned of someone's health rather than the bottom line. So that's the way I, I usually try to go at it. Um, this is Deanna in Weston County, Wyoming. Um, as far as smoke-free homes and cars goes, 
you know, we have, you know, our little kit that we try to get out to the people, and oftentimes we will go through DFS, um, some of our other health agencies to try to get those out. And of course, you want to get them into the hands of the people who are actually smoking. So um, sometimes even doing some campaigns through the media will reach them more so than trying to get them to open up this packet and actually put, say, a plaque on their wall. Another idea is taking a different look at why maybe you wouldn't want to be smoking in a vehicle is to get, say, an article, get a quote from, say, the owner of your car dealership to talk about the resale value of, um, of a car is much lower when they've been smoking in it. The same with, um, you know, with the houses. And like Steve had said, you know, the real estate industry and on that end, they can definitely say that they're going to lose money if they're allowing smoking in their home. So that's just another avenue, of course, in the position I'm in. I'm trying to focus as much on health, but um, bringing home the economic benefits to them is, is a big thing. Okay, thank you both. Uh, talking a little bit about smoking in cars, Steve, can you touch on for us, uh, is vehicle exposure discussed in the Surgeon General's report? Um, it, it's very briefly discussed in terms of um, that, that some what are called activity surveys, you know, looking at where people spend their time and where they're exposed show that um, a substantial proportion of people do report that they're exposed in vehicles and, and, um, and can spend a fair amount of time in vehicles. Actually, I'm just looking at it. It's page 136 of the report, if people have the actual report, that uh, folks who are exposed for at least one minute a day to secondhand smoke, um, they reported, 33% of them reported that they were exposed in vehicles. And of those people, um, they spent an average of about 80 minutes, that's eight zero minutes a day in vehicles. So, so for those who are exposed, I mean, that, that's a fair amount of exposure. The report doesn't look directly at it, but I, I think some recent studies have, have actually measured um, concentrations of secondhand smoke in vehicles with the windows shut or half open and found, you know, not surprisingly that it, that levels can be quite high. So, um, yeah, yeah, so it's it's not as significant um, a, a setting of exposure as the home and the workplace, but um, for, you know, especially for kids or uh, non-smoking adults who have family members who smoke in the car, yes, it's a significant source of exposure. And the report does have a conclusion that, you know, talks about other sources, or other settings of exposure besides the home and the workplace, and it does mention vehicles as one of those. Okay, thank you. I think we're starting to run a little bit close on our time here, so I'll only be able to take one or two more questions. I do know that one question here that we've seen a couple different versions of, um, but there are individuals on participating in this webcast that are from larger communities and have many restaurants and residents to target, uh, and they were looking for suggestions as to how to start with a campaign within a large area any of our speakers that can touch on that. Can I jump in on housing on a, on a large area? A good place to start is um, rental uh, agencies, uh, people that manage housing and apartment owners uh, associations are a good way to start on a, a large number. Uh, I don't really have the answer for the restaurant and bars, but maybe the bar association would be a good place to start. I would add the hospitality associations. Um, no doubt in some of the bigger communities, they're definitely going to have regular meetings, and you can probably get in on on some of those meetings with, uh, you know, the restaurant owners, where you can kind of get them all in one room together. Otherwise, I'd probably suggest some mass mailings initially. And this is Diana Forrester from Wisconsin. I agree with the mailings, any type of media that you can do. Uh, one of the things that we learned in our campaign was to join the Chamber of Commerce, our local Chamber of Commerce. So therefore you can uh, get mailings in their mailings or get on, um, you could go to some of their meetings. We actually had the Chamber fight our initiative, which wasn't a, a good thing in our community. Uh, but since then we have joined the Chamber. Another lesson that we learned was that uh, these restaurants sometimes don't like it when uh, communities just all of a sudden launch 
a campaign and they aren't, they aren't aware of it, I think one of the key things is that if you're in a restaurant or an establishment and the smoke has affected your, your experience, you need to tell the manager that, 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 it's, that you enjoyed the food and the service, but the smoke really affected it and that you won't return. You know, sometimes, you know, what we learned is that we would walk into a restaurant and if it was too smoky, we would just walk right out. But we would never take that next step to contact the establishment and let them know why we weren't coming back. So they need to know that, that non-smokers, you know, would, would like to eat in their establishment. However, they're affected by the secondhand smoke. So that was just a couple of the strategies that we learned along the way. This is Beth in California, and also um, I, some of the strategies that have been used in the large cities in California are to um, produce a smoke-free restaurant guide and distribute it widely. Um, nowadays, there are websites. You might have a website where people could find where the smoke-free restaurants are um, because people will, who care will vote with their feet and will go if they know uh, they can easily find out where those are. Okay, thank you. That leads into one last question, and I will throw it out there to all of our speakers. Are there any creative ways to put pressure on Board of Health members and local policymakers to force them to take action in protecting the public from the dangers of secondhand smoke? This is Diana again from Wisconsin. I've been very fortunate to have strong support from our Board of Health, and I think part of that is keeping them abreast of what's going on in your communities and in your counties. I regularly either bring stuff to my health officer to present to them or I go and present to them and asking them to be a part of the initiative. In our particular community, I asked uh, one of our Board of Health members if she would co-chair uh, the, the committee that is working on an initiative in her committee in her community, and so that has been an effective way that, that I have used to get them on board. I know in other communities, sometimes Board of Health members, they come to the table wearing a different hat, and they don't remember that when they're sitting at that table, they are representing the Board of Health and trying to protect the public from the dangerous health issues. So I think we also need to remind people that, you know, when they're sitting at that table, they need to be representing that mission and that goal of, of supporting the health department and the initiatives and their mission. The other thing, this is Beth in California, I, I could suggest is um, in our experience, people respond very positively to senior citizens and to uh, generally um, older uh, children or teenagers um, making presentations and um, educating boards of health. Okay, thank you very much. I think that will conclude the end of our question and answer time. Thanks, Kim. And um, well, basically, let me just remind everyone um, to please take a look at the links box on the left side of your screen, and you'll see a link for our webcast evaluation form. So if you can please take a moment now to click on that link and complete the survey, that'd be great. Um, just please be sure to click on Submit when you've completed the survey in order to send us your responses. Um, the meeting will actually be open an additional five minutes in order for you to have time to complete the evaluation. Um, again, your comments and suggestions are very important to us and will feed directly into um, what NATO's tobacco project takes into consideration um, for planning future events such as this webcast. Um, so let me take a moment to extend a special thank you to our presenters, uh, Steve Babb, Deanna Ferguson, Beth Thompson, Steve Layton, and Diana Forrester, and for Kim, our moderator. Um, if you have any additional questions um, that we didn't have time to address today, please be sure to email the speakers directly with the contact information they've provided or to nacho at calmpartners.com, and I'm sure they will get fielded to the appropriate um, speaker. Um, and just as a reminder, um, the recording um, today will actually be available on our NATO Tobacco Project webpage. Um, and so that will be available uh, most likely um, 
in about a week. Um, so thank you again to everyone for participating, and we hope to see you here again soon. So thanks, and have a wonderful afternoon.